Essentials of Health Information Management, Principles and Practices, Second Edition, Chapter 2, Health Information Management Professionals. At the end of this presentation, we should be able to differentiate among health information management career opportunities. Identify professional associations available to healthcare professionals. Name the benefits of completing an academic professional practice experience. There are many different careers or career opportunities under a health information management umbrella. With the advent of all the technology that is invading the health information management field, our, the different opportunities have increased. So in this presentation, we're going to look at some of those different um, career areas that, you, that may interest you. We're going to start off by talking about the cancer registrar. And we did mention this in Chapter 1 presentation. And we know what, that, what they do. They collect cancer data and they report cancer uh, statistics to the appropriate healthcare agency. So basically, uh, a lot of times you're going to see that information stored on a database. And so they collect that information to place in that database and they maintain that database. So they enter that information into there. Um, they will see that the cancer program and they're making sure that the facility is in, is in compliance with the different reporting standards outlined for them. If you are interested in being a cancer registrar, uh, most of them they, they usually have uh, go through a college-based program um, where they're going to cover medical terminology, AMP, um, health information management, computer information systems, epidemiology, uh, cancer registry management, cancer case abstracting, coding, staging of cancer, um, and you they have to complete a professional practice experience. You'll hear it's called now PPE or internship or externship. I'm um, using 160 hours. And I do believe AHIMA does have um, a edu cancer education program that a person can uh, take. And, and you do those 160 hours. Um, you also, uh, once you do that, you can become eligible for a credential called a Certified Tumor Registrar uh, Credential CTR that's um, given to you through the National Cancer Registrars Association, NCRA. Um, you have to keep up with CEUs, and CEU stands for Continuing Education Unit. Um, you have to keep up with that, so there is um, a fee associated with um, doing that, and you have to show proof of what you have done for your continuing education hours. Now, a cancer registrar um, can work in hospitals. Um, they can work at regional cancer registries, state cancer registries. They can work at consulting firms. They can work at the CDC. Um, your Center for Disease Control is just a lot of different places um, where in which they can become employed. The coding and reimbursement specialist, we also talked about this function under the Health Information Management Department. You know they assign uh, numerical and alphanumerical numbers to your uh, diagnosis, your procedures, and your services. Um, they abstract that information, with, um, abstract the appropriate documentation to support those codes and those services, um, basically for reimbursement, uh, for research, and statistical purposes. Um, and, and with a coder um, or reimbursement specialist, you can see various training um, methods, uh, most of them are college based, and they also cover medical terminology, AMP, health information management, PATHO farm, um, coding courses, reimbursement courses. Uh, we actually have that here at Tallahassee Community College. Um, and the PPE is usually involved um, with their training as well. But and not only college, but there are also some other non-credit based coding training programs, distant learning and, and so forth in which they can get um, coding education. There are several different uh, credential uh, professional associations um, that 
provide credentials for um, your coder, um, in, like your AAPC, your American Academy of Professional Coders, your American College of Medical Coding Specialists, and your American Health Information Management Association. Now, under your AAPC, here are some of your, the credentials that a coder can get. They can get a certified professional coder or a CPC. They can get a certified professional coder hospital, CDCH, a certified prof professional coder apprentice, CDCA, and a certified professional coder hospital apprentice, CDCHA, and a certified professional coder payer, CPCT. Um, basically, the eighth and apprentice um, are for those who don't, do not have the appropriate experience out in the field, and so they uh, um, they are basically what we call an apprentice. I think with AABC after two years, um, if once you uh, if you gain two years worth of experience, they drop the A from your credential. Your American College of Medical Coding Specialists, um, they have a coding specialist for pair CSP credential, a facility coding specialist, FCS credential, and a professional coding specialist, PCS credential. Under your AHIMA, they have a certified specialist associate, CCA, they sort of the same thought uh, principle behind adding your A to your AABC credentials. Um, that's uh, more of an apprentice. Um, credential. Um, then you have your certified coding specialist, your CCS, and then your certified coding specialist physician based CCSP. And basically, an individual would choose amongst these credentials based on the type of coding or the type of place that they are uh, going to work. You can work or uh, become employed in a variety of uh, settings in a hospital, nursing homes, insurance companies. Uh, governmental agencies, physician offices, you can work from home, from different um, coding companies, uh, those types of things. Um, there's a, a lot of possibilities there. All right, health information managers. Um, and basically, health information managers, they um, manage that patient's health information in those medical records. Um, they make sure that that information are, um, if they say they're using EHRs or something on, in an electronic format, then they're going to administer those computer information systems. They also do coding as well. Um, they kind of manage the whole gamut of functions there. Um, in the department, they make sure everything is organized according um, and analyzed and maintained uh, within that department and make sure quality process is, is occurring. Um, you're going to see your health information managers, they can be either a uh, RHIP or RHIA, those are your credentials. Again, your registered health information technician credentials, your two year programs like we have at TCC. You register health information administrators, RHIA, those are your four year bachelor programs like you have at Florida A and M University. Uh, and in order to get those credentials, you have to graduate from an accredited um, program through CAHIM, um, Commission on Accreditation of Health Informatics and Information Management. And of course your education consists of med term AMP, um, you're gonna do legal um, Health information, coding, database management, quality improvement, uh, computer training, and then there are PPEs usually, and you're, you have to uh, complete in those types of programs. Um, and you take a credentialing examination to uh, receive those RHICs and RHIAs from AHIMA. There are continuing education on CEUs involved, as well as a annual uh, a fee, annual fee that you pay, uh, and your uh, CEUs are up. Um, to be supported every two years. You can work in a variety of settings as well with health information managers, all the, the same usual suspects, hospitals, physician offices, insurance companies, uh, just, just any, pretty much anywhere. Um, you can be a, 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 a department head, a department director, a data quality manager, you can be a consultant, you can be an educator, like I am. 
health insurance specialist. Um, they may be called a claims examiner, so they make sure that everything is in place uh, on the on the claim. Everything is um, necessary according to what that patient's diagnosis is, and they're also going to pay attention to what your insurance or what we call insurance companies, your third party payers, what making sure we're in line with their guidelines. So they got to be familiar with insurance company guidelines. Um, they can do medical billing, they do coding, record keeping, um, and basically in terms of your education, um, it can vary. You can do uh, go to a college or a vocational school um, and things like that. Um, your credentials, you got AHIMA and AAPC. Um, you also have your American Medical Billing Association, AMBA. Um, Um, that has a credential, the CMRS Certified Medical Reimbursement Specialist Credential Exam. You have, to have your International Claim Association, I, ICA, that offers a ALHC credential, Associate Life and Health Claim, and the FLHC, a Fellow Life and Health Claim uh, Credential Exam. Um, and basically, these are for those um, claims examiners within the life and health insurance. Uh, industry, they will take, um, they will try to obtain these type of credentials. Um, your medical association of billers, MAB, they have certification. They have a CMBS, Certified Medical Billing Specialist, um, and they have a Certified Medical Billing Specialist for hospitals, CMBS H. They have a Certified Medical Billing Specialist Chiropractor Assistant, Certified Medical Billing Specialist Instructor. Um, and basically, they have CDUs attached to these as well for each year. They can work in um, the insurance companies, um, in healthcare facilities, physician offices. Um, they can work from home. All of those things are applicable, are, are possible. Health service managers. They basically plan, direct, coordinate, and supervise the delivery of healthcare. Um, they may direct clinical departments or an entire facility. Um, basically, they, um, in terms of, of education, uh, most of them earn a master's degree, but you can, um, it will suffice if you have a bachelor's degree. Uh, if you are in a small facility or you just uh, are a service manager at, your, at a departmental level. So more than likely as you move up into law, uh, more uh, uh, positions that are broader in scope, they're probably going to be looking at a master's degree for that. Um, now, with just in particular with your nursing home, you have to have a special license in order to be a manager over a nursing um, home. You um you you have a bachelor's degree, pass a license exam, uh, and you are you are, you'll be requiring uh, continuing education, and so you get the CNHA uh, credential, certified nurse home administrator um, through the ACHCA, the American College of Healthcare Administrators, in order to be able to run a nursing home. And of course, with um, your employment op opportunities, with your hospitals, nursing homes, and so forth. Medical assistant. Medical assisting sort of overlaps what we do. Is like the things that a health information management person does. A lot of similar things, except for they they add to it a clinical component. So they do administrative and clinical tasks, where we basically stick to um, just the administrative task. In terms of clinical duties, so the administrative um, tasks are similar to the stuff we do. But in terms of clinical um, duties, they might record vital signs, they might help prep the patient, um, they may perform basic laboratory um, tests, they may educate the patient, draw blood, um, just remove sutures, change dressings, and those types of things. Those are the things we don't do. So they, it's a little bit if you are an individual who likes on the health information management side, but also don't mind that patient 
hands-on type medical clinical stuff, then um, medical assisting may be of interest to you. A lot of medical assistants get uh, an associate degree. They cover A and T, med term, medical transcription, keyboarding, accounting, insurance processes, um, pharmaceutical principles, medication administration, first aid, medical law. All of those things are inclo included in a medical assistant program, and they usually do uh, complete a PPE. Um, your your medical assistant. Um, they can get a certified uh, medical assistant credential or a registered medical assistant uh, credential. However, this is not mandatory uh, for medical assistants. But in order for them to be able to take that CMA exam, they have to be in an accredited program. Um, Either through uh, KHEAP or AIDS. KHEAP stands for Commission on Accreditation or Allied Health Education Program. Uh, AIDS, is, AIDS is the Accrediting Bureau of Health Education Schools. And medical systems, anywhere, pretty much any of those clinical types um, people are, you like your physician office, your, your clinic, hospitals, nursing homes, and so forth. Your medical transcription, uh, medical transcriptionists, they transcribe um, dictation and they create medical reports uh, from it, or correspondence, um, or minutes, or anything like that. And they use a headset and a pedal in order to, uh, so they key in as they're listening, and the, a pedal helps them to pause, start, and stop um, as they're typing the document. Um, and then when they're done, they the uh, dictate the type. Report goes to um, the person who dictated it. Um, they will review it and make sure everything's correct, and then they'll sign it. And if it's electronic, like we mentioned, then it'll be uh, routed over in electronic format, and then they they will provide an electronic electronic signature upon review for correction. Um, transcriptionists can work in facilities. Um, or they can work at home, um, and then with the with the speech recognition on the scene, a lot of times your transcriptionists are no longer are just typing um, transcribing documents, but they are doing more um, editing uh, type work um, because the the speech recognition program um, is the person is talking is is typing it. For them, and so the transcription is just go in behind it and make sure it edit everything to make sure it's actually correct. Because that's just a computer doing that. Um, a lot of people were thinking that transcription jobs were in jeopardy due to that speech recognition, but this is not the case. The same thing with the um, encoders that help encode uh, help code uh, records. That's not putting coders a job in jeopardy. A computer can only do so much, so then it becomes more of an editing and a proofreading and those types of things. All right, training for medical transcriptionists. Um, they can go through a post-secondary training through a vocational school or community college or some kind of distance learning program, and they do cover A&P, med term, uh, pharmacology, disease processing, and of course, a keyboarding class, typing class. Um, in, in some type of English class, and they do have PPEs that they can complete. As far as credentials um, are concerned, they have what we call a registered medical transcriptionist (RMT) credential and our certified medical transcriptionist credential, um, and that's through the Association for Healthcare Documentation Integrity Association. There, all right. Um, they can work in physician office, hospital, clinic, um, and all those types of things. Now, there are other career opportunities um, that are available to you, and your book brings out. You got your health data analyst, um, and basically, with a health data an analyst, they are, are they, they work with the um, data. Um, a lot of times in your databases, you have what we call data warehousing that occurs. And what a data, data warehouse does 
is take you have all these different database systems running in a hospital or a healthcare facility, and so that warehouse is going to combine all that data in a way in which when we uh, want to pull information or abstract information um, from that, it may it be available across that entire entire data set. And so when you have a health data analyst, it um, they can take that information and help to uh, manage it and analyze and interpret it so that we can get uh, meaningful information from that data. Um, you can get a certified health data analyst credential through AHIMA. Um, a lot of people with a health information management background who may be who's very logical and thinking, this may be something that's well suited to them. Another um, type of career may be in consulting. Um, and consultants, they, it could be a variety um, of different backgrounds that a person comes from and a variety of different things they can be consulting on. It might be coding, uh, ambulatory care, what have you. Um, medical office manager, or, or sometimes called medical office administrator, they're going to uh, coordinate all the functions in a physician office or a provider's office. Um, they usually have at least a certificate or an associate degree from a community college or a technical uh, college, um, and including that program, they get some um, practical and managerial um, skills, like you said, office practices, medical law, ethics. They uh, complete PPE, um, and then there is a credential um, that they can get uh, called the Certified Medical Manager (CMM) through the Professional Association of Healthcare Office Managers. So that's your medical office manager or your medical office administrator. Now they have medical staff coordinators. Um, they usually report to your um, medical office manager or your medical office administrator, um, and, and basically. They pretty much manage the medical staff in the office, right? And there are some educational um, opportunities uh, from them um, that you, they can enroll in the National Association for Medical Staff Services um, Independent Study Program, uh, and they have two credentials that come from that organization: a Certified Professional in Medical Service Management (CPMSM) or Certified Provider Credentialing Specialist (CP). You have a privacy officer, quality manager, risk manager, utilization manager. Um, these people are people who oversee those different areas. So with a privacy officer, they are, are focused on um, making sure that we are compliant with the different federal and state laws that are regarding uh, privacy. And so we want to, so they ensure that all the privacy practices at that organization is in line or aligned with the different laws and legislations that uh, have been put uh, forth for us to follow. They also have knowledge of the different security technologies and HIM uh, rules and principles um, that take, uh, have something to do with um, privacy. Um, and usually, in terms of education, your HITs, your HIAs, they can um, end up qualifying for being a privacy officer. You have a little experience. There's a credential through a HEMA um, that they can pick up that's a certified in healthcare privacy and security. Your quality manager, it, um, they oversee or uh, coordinate the quality uh, programs within that facility. Usually, you got to have some kind of work experience. Uh, within that field, in order to be hired doing a quality manager um, type position, um, a lot of them you'll see with a bachelor's degree in uh, HIM. Um, they can get credentials as well through the National Association of Healthcare Quality (NHQ). They have what we call a CPHQ, a Certified Professional in Healthcare Quality credential. Your risk manager focuses on different risks that are posed in an organization. Um, they look at uh, minimizing those uh, risks. They and when things occur, they investigate it, uh, analyze it, um, actual and potential risk. They also deal, in, which I mentioned before, in with the incident report. That's where uh, when an incident report is filed, 
it goes to the risk management department where in which the risk manager um, heads up that department. Now, there are several designations that they can pick up. Um, you, you have um, your Global Risk Management Institute that offers uh, your Canadian Risk Management CRM credential, your Fellow in Risk Management CRM, and your IMS Fellow RF designation. Now, your Utilization Manager or your Case Manager we talked about, they, they are concerned with uh, coordination of their patient's care and um, the, those resources being utilized appropriately. Um, making sure um, discharge um, occurs timely and are transferred. Um, usually they're going to have a bachelor's degree um, in something like nursing or social work. Um, and they'll have clinical practice experience, maybe like an RN. Um, you see a lot of nursing and social work people in that uh, case management uh, position. Um, utilization manager, you, you can see some HIM uh, persons working in that area. As a matter of fact, at HealthSouth, um, the utilization uh, coordinator is uh, a RHIA. All right, so with them, you have a, a credential, the certified case manager, CCM credential um, that comes from the Commission for Case Manager Certification, um, which is accredited by your National Commission for Certifying Agencies, your NCCA. Uh, under your McKesson Corp, they offer the CPHM. The Certified Professional in Healthcare Management Credential. Um, then your ABQAURP, these are long um, acronyms, the American Board of Quality Assurance and Utilization Review Physicians, they have the CHCQM Credential, Certified in Healthcare Quality and Management. Um, there are also vendor um, type positions, um, a HIM person may be interested in. Um, in which you uh, provide consulting services, demonstrate different kind of HIM products. Um, these individuals usually have a bachelor's degree or in some type of experience in sales, um, and they need to like, be able to be a team player and be able to manage critical issues if uh, they're interested in being um, some type of vendor salesperson. Um, they may find themselves working in some type of government agency or some kind of pharmaceutical. Um, type industry and, and also as well as research support like for CDC. CPEs, I've been using that term, the professional practice experience, when we were talking about all the different uh, education opportunities associated with, with these type of careers. And, and like I said before, a professional practice experience, you may also hear it called externship, internship. Um, there are a lot of benefits to be had um, when a student does a PPE. Um, for one, it definitely benefits the student because you're getting that experience, uh, that hands-on that you need. You just went through a program and learned all these things from textbooks and everything. And now what you're going to do is go out to the actual facility uh, and, and that you have been learning about and actually do those things that, that we discussed in, in class. So it's like the icing on the cake to your formal education. Uh, it also uh, benefits the facility. They are able to assist in the education of the, their, the future of HIM. Uh, and, and also, you know, just the uh, relationships and, and things of that nature. They, these are fresh people, um, fresh individuals who are moving into the employment pool. And now, especially like with AHEMA, when uh, individual members of AHEMA take uh, students in, within a PPE, they can also get CDUs um, for helping students. So that's just something of a personal nature in which they um, can uh, benefit. So really, your PPE um, is really um, provides value um, to your education. Now. There are certain important steps that uh, occur uh, when we are trying to um, do a PPE. Uh, and, and most of the time, especially with HIM, these, these, these are non-paid. I know certain uh, educational arenas, they have paid internships, but these are non-paid. These are associated with these uh, accredited HIM programs. And it usually is um, 
start off with their um, program director or the program chair. They're going to send a letter to the facility in which uh, we are uh, wanting the student to uh, do their PPE. And they basically going to introduce the, the student and um, fill in those people at the site on um, what type of academic program, what's uh, containing the academic program that they just completed. We do an articulation agreement. Um, figure 2 1 is the professional um, practice letter that your program chair uh, will send on something similar to this, um, in which they are introducing you and, and talking about the program. And then in Figure 2 2, you can actually see um, this is an articulation agreement, our affiliation agreement. We actually have these here. That our program, what we send and where we, um, it's like a contract um, that is signed by the school or the institution as well as the facility and what we agree upon in terms of um, what that PPE, what's going to happen um, in that PPE. Um, and then figure 2-3, this is an evaluation instrument. This is what is sent. Usually we have one um, for the student to fill out as well as the supervisor about their experience. Um, with that PPE. Um, the student, a lot of times, is required to send a professional uh, resume uh, to the PPE site. And they may even have to do an interview before um, being accepted to that site. And this is uh, invaluable. This is an invaluable experience because it sort of mimics the interview process that you will be thrust into when you actually look for a um, job. Now, um, sometimes students will have to um, prove, uh, show proof of their immunization. Um, they may have to do a physical exam, um, orientations at the facility. They may have to go through um, those. They may have to sign. More than likely, they will sign um, a privacy and security um, this non-disclosure agreement. And these are very important. If you violate that agreement, you, you, could, you will be Picked out the PPE site as well as possibly possibly being suspended from your academic program. So this is nothing um, to play with. When you're there, you expect to uh, expect to uh, work. When you are scheduled to work, um, and you uh, you are expected to do what you are supposed to do. If you cannot come or if you arrive late, you are expected to call in. And depending on what the rules are set for in your PPE uh, program, you may have to just call the supervisor at that facility, or you may have to call both the supervisor at the facility as well as the clinical coordinator at your educational institution. You need to be dressed appropriately. Um, this is like a simulated job experience. Any, um, any constructive criticism that is um, thrown your way, you should uh, react appropriately to that. If you have any concerns, then you need to go to the appropriate person about those concerns, whether that be your PPE supervisor or your instructor at um, your academic program. Professional Code of Ethics, all um, associations have uh, what we call a Code of Ethics. A HEMA is included. This is the, the main one um, that we associate uh, HIM with. Um, and although you may or may not be a student member, you are expected to comply with these established ethics uh, through AHIMA. So, with that professional association, as I say, you may or may not be a member. But it is advantageous um, for you to become a member. A lot of times, if you join the professional association like AHIMA uh, while you are a student, you are able to enjoy uh, reduced membership fees. So you, you don't have to pay as much as an actual professional, but still receive some of the same benefits as a person, uh, a professional with active membership. 
You also are able to go to conferences and different meetings and where you can network with different uh, professionals that you may have an interest in the type of career they have. This is invaluable to boosting your career. Um, you can go on Mister, um, and where you, there are different discussions and topic issues going on um, in that. You may you may we get you may be allowed to get reduced certification exam fees. Um, you may have access to additional scholarships and grants by being a member of that professional association. Now this is going to conclude the last of the concepts that I'm going to cover in your chapter two presentation.